Coming up, some Native American communities are at odds over natural resource development at the sacred site Chaco Canyon. We hear from Navajo President Boo Nigren. Plus, an artist is making libraries and museums more accessible. I'm Malia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Amarawa Hopa, thank you for joining us. The purpose of the Indian Child Welfare Act is to keep Native American children with Native American families. We start our newscast today in Oklahoma with the story of Kaysen and Bria Turr, whose family is celebrating a recent ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court. Dakota McDowell Wapakichi reports. Kaysen and Bria became part of our family. <laughs> and so... The Supreme Court's ruling is what people in Indian country hoped for. This is important. It was a 7-2 to majority ruling that upholds a landmark indigenous law, the Indian Child Welfare Act, also known as ICWA. The 1978 law prevents non-Native families from adopting Native children and keeps them with Native families like the Turs and Edmund. Kayla Turr is not Native but married her husband who is Choctaw and says she has learned so much about the Native culture. I can't relate to any of that. Um, my family can't relate to any of that. Um, but I love how the Native culture and traditions are just big on family. The Turs added Kaysen and Bria into their family years ago. The two kids are Cheyenne Arapaho, and they've taught Wes Tur, who is Choctaw, more about their culture. Warriors and survivors and um, really just hardworking people and family people. A key reason for the law is keeping Native children in their culture. Kaysen Turr, who is eight years old, says he has learned about many things, including stickball. I play stickball and this is what I used to play it. You pick it up and you put the ball in there and you throw it. This Native family is like many across not only Oklahoma, but the United States saying the decision to uphold ICWA is a good one. There's so much in a child's upbringing whether it's their identity or their background, where they came from, um, that is better if, if they are raised in that same community. And now, after the high court's decision, home is Native America. In Oklahoma, Dakota mcdowell Apakichi, ICT News. In Maine, lawmakers are backing a proposal to re-add language about the state's obligation to tribal nations. Legislators say the state's printed version of the Constitution should also have its responsibility to tribes. Last week, lawmakers voted to advance the proposal, which restores the state's requirement to honor treaties. These compacts were inherited when Maine broke away from Massachusetts to become its own state more than 200 years ago. Although the treaty language still technically applies, it was removed from the printed version of the Constitution later in the 19th century. State House Speaker Rachel Talbot Ross proposed restoring the language, which she said should be clearer for state residents. Both chambers of the legislature will have to vote again and approve the proposal by a two-thirds majority to send it to state voters. Moving to Washington, an indigenous military veteran, state senator, and advocate for education has died. Tulalip citizen John McCoy served in the United States Air Force from 1961 to 1981 and helped evolve his community into an economic powerhouse. He was elected to the state's House of Representatives in 2003 until he took a state Senate seat in 2013. McCoy served on committees that proposed legislation on many 
key issues, including community development, education, and tribal affairs. He also authored legislation ensuring the teaching of Native American history in Washington public schools. During his time in office, he was one of just a few. There were never more than five legislators with Native backgrounds, despite Washington having 29 federally recognized tribes. McCoy was 79 years old and is survived by his wife, daughters, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Well, Zach Whitecloud is joining a handful of amazing Indigenous athletes who competed on hockey's biggest stage. Whitecloud, who is from the Sioux Valley Dakota Nation in Manitoba, played a key role in the Vegas Golden Knights Stanley Cup win last week. The defenseman played two seasons at Bemidji State in Minnesota before signing with the Knights as an undrafted free agent in 2018. Throughout the NHL playoffs, the Dakota citizen played every game for his team. Team. Citizens from his nation headed to the powwow grounds on Tuesday night to watch his historic win. Following the victory, White Cloud spoke to APTN about this support. Thank you for the support. Uh, the unwavering support consistently as you know, I've, I've gone throughout hockey in my travels and, and uh, I'm thankful for everyone at home for, for following along and, and being a part of the journey and, and uh, no, just, just proud, of my, proud of my heritage, proud of my, my culture and, and uh, proud of where I come from. Staying above the medicine line, a new social media challenge is seeing mermen surface from First Nations in Canada. Native mermen across Manitoba have been washing up on Facebook timelines in recent weeks. The men in the portraits say the latest trend is Indigenous humor at its finest. They have been popping up in social media posts following the recent release of The Little Mermaid. The trend is part of an online challenge to encourage others to strike their finest merperson pose. Ojibwe citizen Kenneth Desjardins, referring to the main villain of the film, said he wanted to be the Little Mermaid but turned out to be Ursula. If you'd like to be part of this challenge, just head to Facebook with your best merpeople photo and use the hashtag merman. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Secretary of the Interior Deb Holland announced new federal protections for the sacred site called Chaco Canyon in early June. The UNESCO World Heritage Site, located in New Mexico near the Four Corners area, is a sacred place to many Pueblos and the Navajo Nation. For the next 20 years, the government will not allow any new oil and gas leases on federal lands. That's around a 10-mile buffer zone of the park. The decision does not affect already existing existing leases, and it was not welcomed by local Navajo people in the area. This was the scene in mid-June at what was supposed to be a celebration hosted by Secretary Deb Holland. Many were headed to Chaco Culture National Historical Park until the road was blocked by protesters. Many of those opposed were Navajo allottees, which are the closest thing Navajo has to private landowners. Their land allotments came as a result of the 1887 Dawes Act when parcels of land were given to individual Navajo households. The area, nicknamed the Greater Chaco Region, is rich in oil and gas, with data showing over 37,000 wells already existing. But those projects have worried people for decades because of the dangers of natural resource development. It includes increased traffic from trucks, degrading water quality, and the potential of leaks or spills, among other associated impacts. Delora Jesus is a Navajo allottee who helped organize this road blockade. She told ICT the money she gets from oil and gas helps her community. We're really blessed with the money we're getting. And then, of course, we have the tri-chapters. We have um, Navajo allottees in that area that are really benefiting it. You know, and this money really helped everybody to get out of poverty. They got new homes, new vehicles. A, be a better way of life and some are even sending their kids to school with this money. 
Many of the allottees say they feel their rights were violated. That includes Suzanne Lopez. My, my kids all work in the oil field and they're taking away their jobs, their resources, and what Holland did is very unprofessional. Alati said what they want is a reversal on this moratorium and to meet with Secretary Holland directly. And no oil company is going to come out here and just, you know, work with the 160 acres. They need more than that. And we try to work with um, Deb Holland, um, Department of Interior, but at no means she never met with us. We only had a small Zoom meeting, but that didn't last very long. We had um, invited her several times to meet with us, but she never acted. Many people I spoke with, including Janine Yazi, say there has been a lot of misinformation spread about this action. Um, we know the moratorium itself does not have any effect on allottees and the lands that they have. It does not have any effect on any of the existing oil leases um, that are already that are already um, in in contract. And so what we're seeing is that that argument is really um, structured to mischaracterize the situation for the benefit of oil companies because it's the oil companies that are off that they can't work through federal lands and um, to continue to exploit oil and gas deposits that are present throughout the region. This conflict is really um, the, the result of internalized colonization and the way people have come to look at their individual land versus our collective responsibility to our shared homeland. Tweedy Paisano Suazo is from the pueblos of Laguna and Acoma. Her car was one of the first to interact with the protesters. I went through a lot of people yelling at me, uh, telling me to go home. I saw other Pueblo members there from uh, about Miami, from uh, Santa Ana. Just like one of the men that was there from Z, I said, you know, and they were confronting him because he was standing there next to me and talking to me. They were saying, why are you here? And he was saying, well, I came to pray. And I'm like, well, we all came to pray. I mean, this is where we come to pray as Pueblo people. Some of the Navajo people here were not against oil and gas. When one Navajo woman spoke out, this happened. I thought it was important for us to rally as Diné people who are in solidarity with our Pueblo relatives um, to show that that's not reflective of the larger Diné grassroots, that we have been fighting and will continue to fight for the protection of our Mother Earth and our waters and our sacred sites. When I asked Navajo Alatis about the impacts of wells, they had this to say. God created these resources. I know it's the future for our grand, our kids and our grandkids. And who wouldn't, you know, want to um, to go the, the, you know, the, the green energy way? But they're not really coming to reality. I, I'm, you know, I'm saying because we're still trying to get our Navajo Lattes the necessities that that everybody else already has. They need water, they need electricity. The Navajos have always voted Democrat, but I think a lot now are, are seeing that, you know, that the Democrat haven't really, they, they, they say that they're gonna help us, but they haven't come forth. But we're getting a more response from the Republican. So I myself am a Republican. And as far as the environmental, it comes from the vehicles, it comes from air conditioning. It doesn't come from these oil and, oil and gas people. They make sure that everything is put back the way it was found. And I don't see no environmental issue down there. Later that day, supporters of the oil and gas freeze drove over 150 miles east to Albuquerque because they were not allowed through the blockade. This morning was not ideal. To see any road, yes, it wasn't ideal. Uh, that's the nicest thing I can say about it. <laughs> to see any road into any of our national parks or our public lands blocked was heartbreaking because our public lands belong to all Americans. 
The Interior Department has backed its decision on the Greater Chaco region, saying it did a thorough and long study. In the meantime, Native leaders are calling for peace. We as Indigenous people should all be together, holding each other and supporting each other. We shouldn't be fighting each other. I spoke with Navajo Nation President Boo Nigren a few days after the blockade at Chaco Canyon. He mentioned both the action and the withdrawal. Let's jump in here. I was outside at the protests at Chaco Culture National Historical Park. I'd like to get your reaction on the Navajo Alatis who put on the demonstrations there. It's not surprising to me because I know that I got a phone call from the secretary's office saying that they were going to visit um, the uh, have a celebration on Sunday. So my comment to the secretary's office was, well, I don't know if it's that's a little too early to be celebrating because I know the Lattes and the Navajo people, the number of phone calls that I got in my office um, to really be celebrating something like that. So I I asked them, I said, Can, is it possible to postpone this maybe six months, nine months and kind of let people uh, let it sink in? Um, so that that was my request to them. And I also asked them to be careful because there's a, a lot of people that are upset. There's a lot of people that are very disappointed in the decision. I don't know if you can share how much you've been briefed on the protests. I know that I witnessed some shouting as well as some pushing and shoving. But what do you know about the protests? What I've been informed is there was just a lot of uh, Navajo people that were very upset. I know that it definitely put us in a, in a tough situation as the Navajo Nation because I know a lot of our people are activists. I know they've been activists for a long time for causes all across America. But when it comes to Chaco, it was difficult because, like I said, I've got two different areas that I fully support. And then you've got Chaco. And then with Chaco, the local community completely opposes it. And so I knew it was a recipe for disaster for the secretary and the outside um, interest groups coming in onto Chaco to do that. And so it, was, it wasn't surprising to me. I think that it's just um, people's livelihoods, people's lands are on the line. And you and I are well aware of how big Eastern Agency is. It's a huge land base and thousands of Navajo people live on there. So when you're trying to force thousands of Navajo people on something that they, they don't want, you should at least expect a few hundred of them to come out and be very frustrated. And, and so and that's what I told them. I said, but as the president, I try to, I try to weave a fine line working with the secretary because uh, a lot of stuff does affect the Navajo Nation. We're in three states. We've got 27,000 square miles, 18 and a half million, 17 and a half million acres that I'm the president over. So I cannot get too into what's going on in Eastern because um, the secretary has a lot of power. And that's what's uh, really frustrating on my end is that the possibilities of her working against me on not getting gravel pits, roads, right of ways and things that go through the BIA, the National Park Service issues that are affecting Western Navajo. So if you know, that's the relationship that I'm really careful about. And to me, I felt like um, I just felt like if the locals don't want it, the tribe doesn't want it, the president supports what the local people are wanting, then that should kind of be the lay of the land. As the leader of the Navajo Nation, do you ever see a scenario in which you're calling on your citizens to stop pinning Pueblos versus Navajos? Or how do you see your role in terms of the actions of your citizens? I think it's, to me, one of the things I think about is, as I mentioned earlier, I think on the Navajo Nation side, we've tried to reach out to the All Pueblo Council. We've tried to reach out to the uh, the secretary's office and then we've tried to propose a five mile and i don't know what more else we can do except when i think that that just shows the frustration i think our people are just frustrated that says you know what we've done our part when are they going to do their part kind of a deal so i think that's where it's i think on the on, like I've, I've extended the invitation to the all public council i've extended the invitation to the secretary's office to Go back out and have coffee and have stew and fry bread and talk with the community and really educate them and tell them that you're sorry that we just came in here and we did this on our own without your support. 
And I think it, the discussion starts there. Do you think that it has been made crystal clear to Navajo Alates that this withdrawal only affects federal lands and for future leases and that it does not at all affect existing leases? So I think that's where I'm going to actually re-challenge the Interior Department, because before this decision was made, we asked them some very straightforward questions on what this actually means economically. And we never got responses on it. We never really truly had a yes or no, or they're not going to be affected. So one of the things I'm going to task my team is to follow up on those questions and say, you know what? We presented these questions to you. You didn't answer them. Uh, you knew there was challenges and challenges to them. So can you answer these questions publicly and guarantee the people that they will not be affected? So that's one of the things I'm going to do, because I like I said, I've 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 consult had consultation. I've had my attorneys, secretaries, attorneys, everybody's on it. The one question we always ask was, well, this is really, truly not affect a lot these moving into the future. And that question was never a yes, they will not be affected. And so I, I'm going to, we're going to follow up on that to get that. If we can truly get that response from the secretary that this is not going to economically impact the people moving forward. All right, then we move on, have another discussion. But to me, it'll be interesting on how they do that response. Well, President Boo Nigren, thank you so much. All right, hug on it. An Anishinaabe artist, storyteller, and knowledge keeper is making changes in the museum space. Hilary Kempinich is a leader in the creation of a science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics museum. She was recently awarded the Bush Foundation Fellowship. Hello to you, Hilary. Bonjour, Anin. Congratulations on the Bush Foundation Fellowship. Tell us about the work that you're aiming to accomplish during this time. Uh, Miigwech, thank you. I, so it's quite an honor to be here and talking about this today. Uh, it's really an exciting time. I have lived in the Greater Grand Forks community for over 20 years, and I've always had this passion for amplifying uh, the voices of our youth, especially our Indigenous youth. And oh, working as an independent artist uh, for you know, the last probably 15 years, uh, I've always wanted to center Indigenous voices, especially those of our women and our youth. And I've done different programming or uh, participated in different events so that we can um, share our knowledge within different spaces. And it's really an exciting time right now. I've come across some dear friends that are very like-minded and want to help our community flourish. Uh, with this uh, future children's museum, we really want to try to get it right before the doors even open, where we are being inclusive to everybody within the community and who might be visiting. Actually, tell us more about the museum, when it'll open, and um, actually about the space and programming. We are actually amidst still the fundraising phases. Uh, we are uh, in that capital campaign, but we are hoping to break ground next year. We don't have a, a date set in terms of opening for that. I, it is going to be centered towards um, younger children, but I really do hope that as we continue to develop this, that this is going to be uh, for all ages, of course, but you know, really bringing in all ages of our youth. Tell us what the benefits are for Indigenous children to have a museum like this and to learn from it. I, I grew up in Turtle Mountain, uh, Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa here in North Dakota. And you know, I really longed for having those spaces where we could foster our curiosity. And, you know, my, my parents were great about traveling and bringing us to different spaces but you know i never saw myself or my people where i come from in those spaces unless they were historical and we really want to be pre represented 
you know, in modern times that we are still here, we're still active in our communities. And honestly, in one of the interviews I had leading up to the Bush Fellowship, one of the interview interviewers mentioned that, that they don't attend spaces like this because they don't feel seen or represented in that. And I'm hoping that I could be one of many people to change that. That's actually a great segue into um, a question about how people can make museums and libraries more accessible to underserved communities. Well, it's really important to really t take a step back and look at look at your spaces. Are you truly being inclusive? We have these keywords that are buzzwords that are being used like diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. But what does that really truly mean? Are we seeing them in leadership roles? Are we seeing them interacting with you know the the attendees and helping with programming and just you know being truly seen and heard? Well, Hillary Kempinich, congratulations to you again, and thank you so much. Miigwech, thank you. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.